planning to coming here today to talk about the future of media. I've spent my career as a journalist, working at the intersection of old media and new media, of digital versus print, of startups versus the old establishment, and of video versus text. But I'm not going to talk to you with you about the future of media. No. I'm going to tell you something about far more important. It's something that happened to me 20 years ago, and this is the first time that I've ever shared this story publicly. I'm going to talk with you about the end of the road. I'm going to talk with you about death. I'm going to tell you the extraordinary story of an extraordinary man and of how he changed my life. I hope that this story transforms your life as well. The man I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to tell you about how he lived and about how he killed more than 100 people. I'm also going to tell you how he killed himself. And in doing so, he taught me the importance of living well and dying well. And believe me when I tell you that you're only fully alive when you're aware of death. And that even if, as Mr. Aubrey de Grey says, if you're able to live longer, what matters to me is my relationship to death. All right, I'm a journalist, so let's get started with our story. 20 years ago, I was a young newspaper reporter living in Virginia. It was during the summer that I received a news tip. Someone told me that there's a famous writer named William McMahon, and he's checked himself into a hotel room. He's got cancer. You've got to go talk to him. You've got to get his story. Apparently, he'd been born in Germany. Um, he'd been a member of the Hitler Youth as a child. His family fled to America before the outbreak of World War II. And then he returned to Germany as a US Marine to fight. And now, according to my source, he was in a hotel room waiting to die. I also must confess that I knew this was just going to be a great story for the newspaper. You know, I was a journalist, and this is it. What, what, what was a man with an Irish name doing, you know, being born in Germany? What did it mean to go back to Germany against his homeland, maybe to encounter his friends and family on the battlefield? It, it just felt like it had all the makings of a great newspaper story. But I also confess a deeper curiosity. I wanted to know what it was like to die. I wanted to ask him, not in some abstract way, what's it like to die, but really, when death is at your door, would this man, whose name I believe was McMahon, would he be stoic? Would he be afraid? Um, was he resigned to it? Was he in denial? What would it be like? Was, was the end of his road going to be, since he's in a hotel room, just ordering room service and drinking a bottle of wine and vodka and steaks and desserts and just going out with a, a, a big splash? No, none of that proved true. Everything I thought I knew about him was false. And everything I thought that I knew about death and dying was also false. So I went and I knocked on the hotel room door. I was greeted not by a broad-shouldered, burly, war hero type. This man was tall and thin. His name was not William McMahon. I had the wrong name. William McEnany was his name. He had blue eyes, smile, always smoking. He lit a cigarette, invited me into his room. But I knew that something was wrong with him. His throat was swollen, and it would get even more swollen in the months ahead. He was a chain smoker, and he had advanced throat cancer. His doctor had given him one year to live one year ago. And his skin already was sort of this yellow pallor, kind of ghostly. And as I was speaking to him, I could barely even hear him. He agreed to be interviewed, but warned me that his voice would soon disappear. And over the next two weeks, I managed three interviews with him that I was able to capture on audio tape before his voice went all but silent. He would whisper like this. And so we would communicate with hand gestures. I wrote him questionnaires, which he answered. Uh, and then eventually, pad and paper, and that's how we communicated. So I want to tell you the story that he told me about his own life. He was born in 1932 in New York City. His mother was American, his father Irish-English. He had a brother one year younger, and neither William nor his brother would die from natural causes. In the late 30s, his father returned to London for military service. He was a Royal Air Force engineer, sent to Singapore. World War II breaks out. He is captured by the Japanese. He spends the duration of the war in a horrific, notorious Japanese POW camp, being tortured, beaten, abused on a nearly daily basis. Meanwhile, 1940, 
London, the London Blitz starts, the Luftwaffe bombing. Months of bombing every night, air raid sirens, people panicked in the streets. William was nine years old, and it was his job to get his mother and his younger brother into the shelter every night. <sighs> William's mother could not cope. She began drinking gin, drinking heavily. One night, she refuses to go into the shelter. They begged her, they pleaded with her, please, mommy, please. They wouldn't, she wouldn't go. In the morning, the boys returned to their home. A bomb had fallen, and they discovered her twisted, mangled corpse in the rubble. Her last words had been, tell Mr. Hitler he can go to bloody hell. <sighs> William and his brother were sent away. William was sent to New York to live with his mother's family. His brother was sent to Ireland to live with his father's family. It was a move to protect them, but it was a move that would turn disastrous. William ended up in a street gang, stabbed somebody, went to reform school, jail for kids. <laughs> um, his brother got mixed up as a preteen with the IRA, the Irish Revolutionary Army, and may even have participated in some gun battles and bombings. After the war ended, his father was released from the POW camp, went through a series of military hospitals. The boys are summoned. They return, expecting for a happy reunion with their father. Not to be. He's a shell of a man. He can't even get out of bed. He's completely just ravaged. Um, and he died a few weeks later from the culmination of all the beatings and wounds and infection that he had received. Now, it's important that you understand these details of his life so you understand where I'm going with this. My purpose at now was being to change. Summer was becoming fall. I was not a newspaper reporter anymore. In fact, I was becoming his friend, his caregiver. I would visit him every day. In the morning, I would stop in and check on him. I'd go to work. I'd check on him again at night. The cancer was progressing rapidly, and he had few treatment options. He did not want to die in a hospital like his father. He wanted to die in the hotel room. He wanted to die facing the end of the road head on. I would visit him daily. I'd go to the grocery store. I'd get him milk, applesauce, oatmeal. He could not swallow solid food, um, fruit pies, um, oh, and cigarettes. Always cigarettes. He was a Winston 100 man, two packs a day. Uh, not just one pack near the end, it was up to two packs. Uh, the cold milk would soothe his throat. The oatmeal gave him the nutrition, and the cigarettes gave him pleasure. Now, after his father died, William was very angry. In his own words, he told me he was full of murderous rage. He had a real desire for violence. So he returns to America, enlists in the United States Marine Corps, and goes to Korea. He joined to, to fight there. He spends three years, and he achieves the rank of a sergeant. Early in the war, he falls in love on leave with a Japanese prostitute in Kyoto, the, the country that had killed his father. Every time he went on leave, he'd go visit her. She had, her family had a centuries-old samurai sword, which she gives him for protection. Many of the battles in the Korean War involved trench warfare, and the Chinese soldiers would employ a technique that he called a pylon. A lot of them would take drugs or get drunk on wine, and they'd charge, they'd amass hundreds of soldiers and just charge a single point of the trench line, knowing full well that those in front would be mowed down, just slaughtered. But the idea was that enough bodies would fall into the trench that they could overrun the line, split the lines. <sighs> William took the samurai sword and defended against these assaults. With the sword, he killed 76 enemy soldiers. He killed dozens more with his machine gun and with his rifle. He was wounded several times. He received three Purple Hearts, a Bronze Star, and other medals and commendations for valor. <sighs> After the Korean War, he enrolled at Balliol College at, at Oxford University. He studied fine art, painting. He met the American poets, W.H. Auden and Robert Frost. Here he felt alive, he said, for the first time. He was really, really just enjoying it. He was using his brain, he was using his heart, he was using his creativity. He also fell in love with a girl his age. That she was wonderful. She also discovered that he had been keeping a log of kills, as he called it. Each of the 76 enemy soldiers that he had hacked and slashed and stabbed, he would recorded in a journal, sometimes even taking their photos. She destroyed that log. William was confused, in his own words. He didn't know what to make of all the death that he had seen and all the death that he had caused. So he answered those questions of death with more death. He joins the French Foreign Legion and fights in Tangier, Morocco, and Spain. Then 
Finally, in the 1960s, he meets up with his brother in New Zealand. His brother is also a mercenary now. And William is exhausted. He's not exhausted from life. He's exhausted from death. He's exhausted from killing. Inspired by Paul Gauguin, he begins painting again. He sails around the South Seas, painting beautiful canvases of domestic life. He moves back to America, has an opening at a famous New York City gallery. It's a smash success. He begins to think, maybe he could make a living as a painter. Maybe he should do this. But it feels too abstract. Too, it's just not specific enough. So he moves to San Francisco. He decides to write a novel based on his life. And there he exchanges poetry with Gregory Corso and Allen Ginsberg. He paints with Lawrence Ferlinghetti. He meets Jack Kerouac. And according to William, they thought he was an uptight Englishman. He, they were hippies and wore casual clothes. He wore a suit. They smoked pot and drank wine. He sipped tea. They laughed and caroused. He scribbled and sketched and, and sat alone. He publishes his masterpiece. It's called A Sense of Dark. He uses a pseudonym because it's so real to life. The narrator is based on him. He changes his name from Balliol College. He drops an M over the B, William Maliel. Um, the critics, it, it's published a critical acclaim. The New Yorker calls it a novel of almost intolerable intensity. Uh, it's a bestseller, and it remains today one of the top novels about the Korean War. But then after the success of the book, William wasn't sure what to do next. It was his creativity gone? He'd purged himself of all these experiences. He got a steady job. He got married. He got divorced. He kept writing and painting. He moved around. He got another job, so on. In 1980s, he, he publishes a second novel. In that same year that his brother was murdered, his brother became a CIA agent and was executed in Bogota, Colombia. Like the book's narrator, William told me that he had become an angel of death. It's a truism to say that he found art, but he had. Painting the island people, writing about death, he'd exercised it from his life. And he was able now, he told me, that he was able to live life with a full embrace of death, living with that full knowledge that death is a part of life. And so that summer 20 years ago, when I met him in Virginia, he was back, he was an ordinary man. He was working as the editor of a financial publication. However, he wasn't just ordinary because he was dying of cancer. His condition was worsening. He was growing very weak. He was having trouble standing. He, he couldn't breathe. Uh, his throat was now enlarged past his chin. Something was wrong. The doctor had told him he had only a few weeks left before he'd have to go into the hospital. William, what's wrong, I asked. <sighs> he paused, lights another cigarette, waves me over. I sit next to him on the hotel room bed. He whispers in my ear, I want you to help me kill myself. No, I said, I stood up, I moved away. He said it again. I want you to help me kill myself. No, I said. We argued for the next several weeks. For every objection I raised, he had a rebuttal. He had thought it through. This was not an impulsive decision. And my first reaction was to talk him out of it. No, no, no. Life is sacred. It's against the law. I called a doctor. I called a lawyer. I called a suicide hotline. I called his friends. You know, we can't let him do this. We can't let him do this. But he wanted to do it. He wanted to face his death, his end of the road, head on. But we were running out of time. We were running out of time for two reasons. One, his cancer. The throat was here now. The cancer spread up his jaw into his ear, totally swollen. Moreover, inspired by his life, I had decided to move to San Francisco and write a novel. And I had to leave at the end of the month. Um, and, I, and I began to worry, did he have the courage to kill himself before I moved away? I know I didn't have the courage to help him do it, and I no longer, but I no longer disagreed with his decision. And as I would learn in the days ahead, he had enough courage for both of us. He had obtained a book called Final Exit. It's a suicide guide. It's a manual of how to kill, your to kill yourself. It covers all the methods, hanging, hemlock, gun gunshot. Uh, William decided that he would overdose on sleeping pills. Will you help me get the pills? No, I said. Will you help me get the pills? No, I said. I, I just refused to do it. Final Exit also warned that if you take too many sleeping pills, you may lose consciousness and then vomit up the pills. So to, rec to, so to prevent that from happening, after you swallow the pills, take a plastic bag, put it over your head, and put a rubber band around your throat. You'll suffocate. Will you help me? Will you put a plastic bag over my head? William... <laughs> I deadpanned. 
the rubber band won't fit around your throat. He laughed, I laughed. True gallows humor. Um, really, if I take the pills, will you place the plastic bag over my head? Again, no. I said, no, I'm not going to help you do this. And this time he did not argue. He understood my position, and I understood his. As the end of the road came near, William could no longer swallow. He was starving to death. He was surviving only on liquids and cigarettes. The skin was stretched very tight. Everything was swollen, disfigured. Everything was shutting down. And our conversations became more intense, more powerful, even more emotional than ever. And then finally that afternoon, he wrote, Today is the day. Will you come back tonight after work? Yes, I said. So I was a wreck at work that day. I was very sad, very scared. I didn't know. I was scared about what I was going to have to do that night. But I actually didn't know what I was going to have to do that night. I didn't know what death would be like. I didn't know how I, would, how I would face it. And when I got there, he showed me he had everything planned. He had a bottle of sleeping pills. He had a glass of milk. He had a plastic bag. He had a rubber band. He had a cremation policy, a suicide note, and a big stack of dollar bills for the hotel staff who was going to find his body. So we sat together. We sat together for hours that night. I held his hand. I threw my arm around him. We watched TV. We hugged. He made me vow to come back in the morning and find his body. And then finally, around midnight, he said, it's time for you to go. And yes, I said. I said goodbye. From that night, I cried and I cried. I looked up in the night sky, and I, I promise you, I saw the stars, I saw the plants, I saw comets. I saw so many comets that night. And then the next morning, I went to his hotel room door. I listened outside the door. I was silent. I let myself in, opened the door, I walked in. And he was alive. He was sitting on the bed smoking. I couldn't believe it. I, William, you're alive. You didn't do it. And he was so sad, but I was so happy. He was mad, and I was happy. And he was scared, and I was still happy. You know, what happened? What happened? Why didn't you do it? And he explained that he had been worried that he would not be successful, that he would fail in his attempt. He also admitted that he wasn't afraid of death, but he was afraid of dying. Will you come back tonight, he asked. And now, I was leaving for San Francisco the next morning. Of course I was going to come back. Yes, I said. <sighs> when I got there, we talked. This was our last conversation. And he told me that it dawned on him that he didn't want to be alone. That was the, the chief reason. He wanted me to be there. And, you know, he said, we're fucked up about death. What, 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 how bad can it get? It was the dying that bothered him. And he was well prepared. He had his checklist. He had, he, the lethal dosage of Secanol, the sleeping pill he was about to take, is 30 tablets. The final exit book recommended 40, and he had 60 of them. He took each of those 60 capsules. He just opened them up one at a time, poured the, the, the powder into his glass of chocolate milk. He stirred it all up. Getting them down would be the most difficult part. He didn't want to swallow. He, was having, he didn't want to vomit. He was terrible swallowing. And I was grim. I was crying. I was, I was you know, silent. Just tears in my eyes. And he said, you know, I feel sorry for you. And I said, no, don't feel sorry for me. You know, it's about you. You know, don't feel sorry for me. And then, you know, he, he was empathetic. And we just looked at each other. And there was just, it was, um, uh, I don't know. It was, he drank it down. He just did it. He drank it down. And he wrote, you know, this is simple. This is going to be clean. You know, this is good. His last sentence that he wrote was, stay with me until I doze off. His eyes fluttered. I looked at him. He started to fall asleep. His breathing became the breathing of a sleeping person. I waited, and then I left the room. And the next morning, I didn't sleep. I got up in the dark through my duffel bag and boxes in this car I had to drive cross country. So the long drive from Virginia to California. I didn't know if William had been successful or not. I didn't know. I, it was, I think it was in Tennessee or someplace. I, I pulled over. I took a stack of quarters. This is payphone days with no mobile phones. And I called up a friend of his at work and I said, please go check on William. Go call the hotel. Someone has to go check on him. Just find out. I didn't know if he was alive or dead. And I drove the rest of the day. I put another, gas, another tank of gas in the car and I drove and I called back and I learned that yes, he had killed himself. He had done it. And I was neither happy nor sad. I, I didn't know what to feel. I just knew that he was happy, that he had faced his end of the road head on. And so I'd like to ask you the questions I had asked at the very beginning of myself when I first met him. You know, 
Are you living your life fully? What is your relationship to death? Before William killed himself, he wrote something. He said, promise me you will tell our story. And now, 20 years later, today, I have finally, publicly, for the first time. And so let me ask you the same question that William asked me more than 20 years ago. Will you promise to tell our story? Thank you.